Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. For some of us, buying a lottery ticket might seem like an irrational decision. We convince ourselves that the chances of winning are remote. But in a new book, The Rational Animal, Carlson School of Management professor Vladis Griescavages explores the role evolution plays in our economic decision making and shows how seemingly irrational choices can be rooted in purposeful evolutionary traits. In other words, risk may indeed have its rewards. This month on Access Minnesota, we sit down with Professor Grease Cavages to discuss the role that evolution plays in our economic choices and why most people make contradictory or hypocritical decisions with money. Vladis Grease Cavages is the McKnight Associate Professor of Marketing and Psychology at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. His new book, written with Arizona State University Professor Douglas T. Kenrick, is titled The Rational Animal, How Evolution Made Us Smarter Than We Think. Professor Grease Cavages, welcome back to Access Minnesota. Thank you for having me. First of all, tell us about your motivation along with your colleague to write this book in the first place. Well, it actually started out quite a while ago, and it's why I got into studying psychology and, and marketing. Uh, I was born outside of this country. I was born in Lithuania when it was still part of the Soviet Union. And when I was a little kid, we moved to the United States. When I was 10 years old, I remember getting off the plane, a Boeing Pan Am jumbo jet, and instead of taking me to where we're going to live, uh, my uncle took me to the supermarket and I had never seen a supermarket before in my life. I'd never seen so many flavors of ice cream. I thought there was one flavor, it was milk. And they said I could buy anything I wanted at that store. And I remember walking around the store for 15 minutes looking at all these things and looking at all the meats and said, wow, there's so many options. And what did I pick out my very first purchase? It was a pack of pink Bubblicious Watermelon Bubble Gum. And that was my very first purchase as a, as a capitalist. And what really led to down the line is me thinking about how do people make decisions? How do you choose what to buy when you're in this overwhelming situation of having plentiful choices? And many years later, it led down to this book. How did your experience growing up in the then Soviet Union inform some of your research and some of the directions you s decided to take with this book? I'd say quite a bit, quite a bit where my background, I really didn't grow up in a world of advertising, didn't grow up in a world of consumerism. And going from having none of that to being surrounded by that, inundated, it, it had such an interesting quality to it. When I was exposed to seeing ads for the first time, whether it's for morning cereal or, or something else, it was fascinating to me. There were like little stories to me. And down the road, I, what I wanted to find out is how does this stuff work? How does it actually affect people's psychology? And is there more than meets the eye to some of these things? The subtitle of the book is How Evolution Made Us Smarter Than We Think. How have these evolutionary traits helped determine our consumption and spending habits? Well, one thing that happened to me is when I went to college, I first learned, I studied economics because I was interested in how people make decisions. And economics taught me that we're very rational people. And then we do things to very rationally and smartly, and when we shop, we calculate everything out. And I said, oh, okay, that's how people behave. Then I went to graduate school. Graduate school said, no, 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 that's not how we behave at all. Instead, all these psychologists and behavioral economists found that we are irrational, we're very biased, there's a lot going on in our subconscious, and we're actually kind of foolish oftentimes. We make a lot of irrational choices. And this was really confusing to me because it contradicted everything I had learned. So what I had done since graduate school is looked at what could this mean, all these puzzles, all these irrational behaviors, is there more to it than meets the eye? And what this book does is it takes the lens of Darwin and looks at puzzles through an evolutionary perspective in the same way that Charles Darwin would have looked at the peacock's tail and said, this is weird. This doesn't help the peacock survive at all. Why would the peacock have this stuff? Well, people do lots of weird stuff. 
the question is why would our brain evolve to do lots of this weird stuff? And often there's a reason, as long as you have the right magnifying glass looking for that reason, where people really are smarter than we think. So in what way are people actually like peacocks? Uh, there's actually quite a bit of resemblance. In one place where people, especially men, remember peacocks are males, they're not peahens, where men are like peacocks is when it comes to luxury spending. When men are buying a Porsche, when men are buying expensive, gaudy, flashy things, it's actually not very different from when a peacock flashes its feathers, fans it out. And what we found out is that men do this a lot of times specifically to impress women to get attention from the opposite sex. And what's interesting about it is that women are actually, it's quite effective to do it. Where women would rather go out on the date with a guy who has the Porsche, who has the flashier thing. Now women aren't always falling for this. They'd rather go on a date with him, but they don't necessarily want to marry the guy with the Porsche. In fact, they'd rather marry the guy who drives the Honda because he's the more reliable guy. Not as fun as the guy with the Porsche though. So to what extent do those kind of evolutionary traits drive our behavior? I mean, this certainly makes sense. If you look at the animal world, the females will look for males whom they believe are the strongest, uh, would provide them with the healthiest offspring. Is there a real carryover of that trait into the way we conduct ourselves economically? Well, if you think about human beings, so we are rational animals. Now, what's been looked at over all these years is whether we're rational or not rational. But what's been ignored is the complete other half. Well, what does the animal inside the rational animal look like? And the human animal is not all that different from every single other organism out there. We've been shaped by the same principles of evolutionary biology. And underneath it all, if we peel the layers of all our hyper-rationalizing consciousness saying, well, we did it for this reason or for that reason, underneath it all, we behave, we're driven by the very same reasons as every single other critter on the planet. And it comes down to some very simple things. We want to be safe. We want to find a mate. We want to eat. We want to be healthy, avoid disease. We want to have friends. We want to ascend the social hierarchy, and we want to care for our family. And at the end of the day, almost every purchase that we make, I'm in the marketing department, I focus on purchases, almost every purchase is driven by one of these evolutionary needs, even if people are not always consciously aware of them. Let's talk for a moment about the impact of our environment growing up on our future spending habits. Say, for example, a child grows up in poverty. How will that influence that child's spending and saving habits going forward? Yeah, our childhood actually has quite a bit of an effect. Where it used to be, people think that you inherit your genes from your mother and father, and whatever they are is whatever you're going to be. Well, it turns out that early childhood environment can have some dramatic effects. And it's not just when you're in first grade or seventh grade, those traumatic experiences that we remember very well often is what happens in the first five years of life. And what new research is finding is those first five years, what's really critical is how predictable your environment is. From day to day life, are things fluctuating? Are you having dinner the same time every night? Are you going to bed the same time every night? Are the people who are living in your house, your mother and father, your parental figures, the same people every night? Or are there different people rotating throughout your life? And what you see down the road is people who lived in a very predictable environment as childhood. They expect their adult life to be predictable. Their childhood is like a blueprint for their adult life. And these are the folks who, when they come into money, they don't feel very compelled to, to spend it right now. They're OK with saving it, because they know if they hang on to this, things will be predictable. Their money will be around later on. What's more interesting is what happened to the folks who grew up in the unpredictable environment, in that fluctuating world. These are the folks who often, when they go from rags to riches, they often end up going back to rags, end up in bankruptcy court. We sometimes see certain spending and savings traits attached to a particular generation. For example, the, the veterans generation grew up during the Great Depression. 
many people in that era had uh, suffered great deprivation. Yeah. We often think of them as being very frugal, but somewhat ironically, then they're accused of raising the most profligately <laughs> spending <laughs> generation, perhaps in history, the baby boomers. Is there are there any generational patterns with regard to whether you're a spender or a saver? You know, certainly people differ in generations. So I teach college students today, and these folks are probably the most entitled college students that our country has ever seen, where it's me, 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 I should get more and more and more. But underneath it all, underneath those differences at the top, they're actually very similar individuals. The brain of the student in my class today is the same exact brain as a student in the 1950s, as a student 100 years ago. Our underlying psychology is the same today as it was before. And what this book is about is looking at that underlying psychology and working through the differences that we see at the surface, saying underneath it all, what are the commonalities? When Access Minnesota returns, more of our conversation with U of M professor Vladis Griscavages and his new book, The Rational Animal. Access Minnesota will return after these messages.